no lecture next week because it's spring break. Uh, so don't show up, no one will be here. Um, also, if you guys could scoot as close to the middle as possible, it just makes it easier for students who are trickling in late to find a seat and they don't have to climb over you. Um, so if you guys could scoot as close to the middle as possible, that would be great. One, two, three, stand up, scoot to the middle, go. <laughs> Everybody in the back hear me? Yeah? Okay. If you can't hear me, raise your hand. Yeah, I'm just checking. checking. Checking the wind here. How's everybody doing? This is my first. How's everybody doing? Good. You guys got to give me a little bit of juice. I, I, I'm not one to also just lecture and talk at people. Um, well, I guess if you ask my students and my child, they'll say, uh, they'll say otherwise. But I really appreciate some type of engagement, some type of back and forth, some type of call and response, some type of energy exchange. So I'm not, so I feel kind of energized or vitalized by you all, and so that you are awake and learning and open to what I have to offer. And it is an offering. This is just an offering for you to consider in your class, in your leadership endeavor and path. Um, let's do this. Uh, let me have you folks uh, close your eyes for just a few minutes, a few seconds. Close your eyes. person who's not closing their eyes, I invite you to close your eyes. You too. <laughs> and let's just bring all the parts of ourselves that are still arriving to this lecture hall, this beautiful lecture hall, where you, get, where you get to hear my beautiful voice. All right, so bring your attention or your awareness to your feet on the ground, the chair underneath you, the sound of my voice, the others around you. Just bringing our focus into attention to this time we get to spend a little bit of time together. And now I want you to bring to mind or memory um, somebody who has embodied some type of leadership uh, quality who is no longer with us. Okay? That could be a family member, a friend, it could be a historical figure. But I want you to bring into mind that quality that leadership quality that embody, they embody that inspires you. Bring that person to mind. Good. All right, when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. Notice the quality of the room or the space and the environment now after those 20 seconds. Shift a little bit, right? more focused, more relaxed, more present, and perhaps maybe even energized or inspired by a person uh, who you brought to mind. Um, so we're gonna talk about being in community and leadership as community building and four kind of elements or aspects of community building that I think are important uh, that aren't dissimilar to what you're learning in the relational leadership model. It's not dissimilar to what you're reading in, uh, on your, in your textbook, what Gardner says, all these wonderful things that are basically the same thing. Um, Leadership is really about cultivating space or environments for belonging, purpose, support, learning. Um, and we do this through a lot of practices, processes, and even rituals. Um, what's a ritual? Every time I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth before I eat. Every time I wake up in the morning, I hold my, uh, uh, my son and talk to him before he leaves. It's something that I do with attention over and over again. 
Some rituals are, are, are ones that we're aware of. Uh, those of us who might have played sports, we might have had some pregame ritual. I eat this meal, I wear this sock. You know, some rituals uh, we might not be aware of. Um, I check my phone every time I wake up in the morning. I check my news feed, check my email. And then when I bring awareness to that, I go, shit, I've been checking my phone 10, 15, 20, 30 times a day, 30 times an hour, 30 times half day. So rituals are just practices, things that we do repeatedly with attention, whether or not we're aware of them, aware of them or not. So one ritual that I used to do a long time ago when I was a, 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 a long time ago, <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, with my friends is uh, we would, uh, and, and uh, how, how should I put this delicately? Uh, we'd pour, we would pour booze on the concrete uh, in memory of those friends and family members who are no longer with us. The, the more uh, colorful phrase is pouring a little liquor out for the homies. Right? Anybody heard of this or familiar with this or even participated in this? Good. So it might, you know, from, from the outside of it says, oh, that's something that, you know, these kids or these types of people do, you know, how silly, how stupid, how, how gangster, how all these things. But it actually has a deep, deep, deep lineage or legacy of paying due respect to those elders or people who impacted us um, who are no longer with us. It's called pouring libations. Water is a symbol of life. We pour libations, just recognizing, hey, we didn't get here on our own. That we are a part of a larger legacy or community of leaders, of people, et cetera, et cetera. So, I want us to pour libations today as part of, as part of our leadership ritual. And how we're going to do this is, and some of you know, uh, uh, I'm looking at one student who I won't call out because I, I'm deeply respectful of her, um, that I am a science fiction um, uh, nut. I'm a huge science fiction fan. I love Star Wars, Star Trek. I like um, Battlestar Galactica. And so when I say, so say we all, when I say saying Battlestar Galactica, I want you to respond with, so say we all. Can we do that? So say we all. So say we all. OK, let's try it a little, with a little bit more energy. I know, I know people are like, what's going on? It's OK, just trust me. We're just going to have a little fun with this. So say we all. So say we all. Awesome, Battlestar Galactica. All right. So I brought some water, and I'm going to pour libations in memory of my grandfather, Ingracio, and my grandmother, Eleanor, whose leadership qualities of grace, hence his name, Ingracio, um, and my grandma was just a badass. I don't know how that's a trick. Uh, badassery. Uh, grace and badassery. Uh, I pour libations for Eleanor and Ingracio, and I'll repeat. Four libations for Eleanor and Gracio, so say we all. So say we all. Right. So let's do that. I want a few of you to call out the people who you brought to memory, who are no longer with us, who have who embodied some type of leadership quality that you that we bring with us, that you bring with you here. Four libations for Malcolm X. Can you repeat, please? So let's try that. That was my mistake. My mistake. I changed it up. Uh, you will say Malcolm X, or whoever you say, and I'll say it one more time. And say it again. So say we all. So say we all. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. Back. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. One more time. So say we all. So say we all. All right. Now on the count of three, whoever whoever you brought to mind, uh, say it out loud. One, two, three. <laughs> so say we all. So say we all. Excellent. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for playing. You know, whenever we bring ritual into the game, people go, what's going on? But, but, but I don't know if you notice, it's interesting. It can create an interesting quality or interesting environment 
uh, when we do so. So we're talking about being in community as it relates to leadership, right? And, and I would argue or suggest that being in community is all about relationships. Uh, we live in a culture, particularly a Western culture, with a long legacy of really promoting the rights and responsibilities of individuals. We, are, we like the idea that we are unique individuals, we have unique, unique gifts, interests, talents, all these wonderful, beautiful things that make us individuals. Um, and our sense of identity, the sense of who we are, uh, is always created in relationship with or to other people and environments. Let me say that again. A sense of who we are, our identity, or our identities, are created, are created in relationship with or to other people and environments. So we ask the, 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 the age-old question, the wisdom tradition question of who am I, which kind of we ask all times, all the time throughout our lifetime at different periods, who am I? We, we see that it's always, the answer is always in relationship to what somebody else, some other role. Okay? Who am I? I am a son. Right? I'm a son of parents from Stockton. Who am I? I'm a brother. I have an older brother. I have a younger brother. Who am I? I am a parent to a seven-year-old child. Who am I? I'm an educator who's been teaching for 20 years. Who am I? I am a friend. I am an activist. I'm from Sacramento. Anybody from Sacramento? Yes. That's, these are some of my people right here. Uh, who am I? I am a chocolate fan. Any chocolate fans here? This is my community of people. Who am I? I am a Filipino. Any Filipinos here? These are my community of people. Who am I? I'm middle, I'm middle aged. <laughs> I saw some people at work in the tank in the back kind of sheepishly raise their hand. Any middle aged, middle aged. Oh, I'm not middle aged yet. <laughs> I was on now. I'm, <laughs> I'm 40, I'm 41. I'm middle class. Not always I'm middle class. I am heterosexual. I'm an American. I'm a Kings fan. I'm a poet, etc., etc., etc. Who am I? So if you begin to go down the list of who am I? You see that, that that role or identity is always in relation to some other, other person, right? right? So we are deeply relational. Uh, we are deeply in community. We're embedded in community. The very first exercise or ritual we did was to get you to see how you're part of a community. Uh, people who are no longer with us, but nonetheless have influence on who you are. Yeah? Does that make sense? All right. Any questions on that? Now, I will say, you know, uh, so one of the things, what, what we can take away with this notion of uh, um, we, are, we are relational beings is that we have multiple identities and we have intersecting identities, right? Uh, in the work that I primarily do around, around uh, cultural studies, social justice work, uh, um, we look at the ways in which different identities, cultures, and communities intersect, right? So in certain contexts or certain situations, my Filipino-ness means something especially more to me when I'm with my family or I'm, with, uh, I'm at a club where there's a lot of uh, social club. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just went to a dance club with my family, so that's why I got, I got a little confused there. If I'm at a, an organization where there's primarily Filipinos, then that aspect of my identity comes to play more. Okay? Um, on, the bas you know, on the basketball court, Obviously, my basketball uh, playing comes into play more, as does Alvin. Alvin's a really, really great basketball player, very competitive. Um, obviously, I'm an educator here on the stage, but I don't separate that. I can't separate that from my Filipino-ness, from my maleness, from my uh, chocolateness. Do <laughs> uh, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but, I, but I'm valuing or privileging or bringing forth that aspect of my identity that I feel best serves, right? The educator identity. You know, I think I have a full identity too. My mom tells me, you're full. You know? I say, yeah, bring the form and see what it uh, So we, have, we, have, we hold multiple identities and they intersect and depending on the place and the time and the location and perhaps on the politics and other, and other things that can be more heavy and negative, aspects of our identity are more present or aware or brought forth. All right? So this is all to say uh, for the purpose of this lecture that you know, we're part of multiple communities. Okay? And now leadership, uh, leadership I see and experience primarily as community building. 
okay? And that, and that as, as community builders, you know, community building, it involves fostering belonging, fostering a sense of purpose, fostering support, and fostering learning uh, for myself and others. And that, that, the last part is really, really, really important. Because often, uh, kind of the old school take on leadership or the, or the great question, the great matter here is that I am leading others to feel belonging, to feel purpose, to feel resource, so that they learn. You know, but, but there's a relationship, again, there's a relationship. It's like, well, I need to do that for myself in relationship with this community. Right? So the belonging is not just for us, you, you as a class, or you in a fraternity or sorority or a club or a family member. It's not for just everybody else, it's for you as well, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not just leading my soccer team. I'm also participating in the learning and the development, my own development. Does that make sense? So that, that, that's the type of participatory leadership that I, that I, I, I like to privilege or talk about. Um, leadership for me is, can be very formal. Oh, I'm taking University 238 so I can <coughs> become a peer mentor, so I can become uh, change the name to CSA, 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 sorry, a CSA, so I can, you know, do this and this, and hold an official leadership position on class, so I'm going through the steps so that I can formally hold a position of leadership, okay, and that's, I think that's a great thing. I formally have the title of director, that denotes some type of leadership thing that I do here at Sonoma State, et cetera, et cetera. These are formal titles, formal ways in which we can, we can embody uh, uh, this term or concept of leadership. There are a lot of informal ways which I think, uh, which I know that this class, uh, class in this book talks about it, uh, at least to, to, some, to some extent. Um, I know that I am, am demonstrating leadership to my girlfriend, right? Uh, when, when we talk about how can I, how can I best uh, make her feel like that we're connected, that we belong to each other, right? How can I make sure that it's not just about I, it's not about you, it's about the we, right? There's a sense of belonging to each other. There's a sense of purpose. Why are we together? Right? There's, a, there's a sense of support. How are we fulfilling this purpose of partnership? There's a sense of learning, right? How many of you five years ago are the same person that you are now? That's good. That's good. Um, I mean, I remember when I was in college. I remember when I was in college. I said, "Okay, I know it all. I get it all. I've studied this. I've studied this. You know, I know. I know when I was in grad school. I get it all." I know when I start teaching, I get it all. I know last yesterday I go, yeah, I get it all. You know, it, 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 there's constant, there's constant learning. Right? There's constant. Learning. Um, and so leadership can be expressed both formally and informally. How many people here have, for friends or for uh, family or uh, for um, peer groups, meaning? soccer teams, religious organizations, or uh, work groups here on campus, study groups. How many of you have, have enacted some type of leadership? Not necessarily formally. It's just, no, let me see, this person needs some support, or this person needs to feel like they belong. How, I'm curious, how do you, what are some of the rituals or practices that you have to enact these leadership? Uh, what are some of the rituals or practices that you have that, that uh, you share with others? Can I hear just a few? So tell me, the, tell me the context, right, the group, and then tell me what you do. And then give us your name, of course. Uh, I'm Becca. Becca, can you speak up a little bit more, please? Yeah, no Thank you. You can stand up, that's fine. <laughs> We're going to democratize the space a little bit, so I'm not the only one standing. You said signing? Smiling. Smiling, smiling, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's the connectivity, and I heard you say listening. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, very, very, very important. Probably, for me, it's probably the deepest quality of leadership is deep listening. Yeah. Thank you. Let's hear from a couple of other people. Oh, you can clap, that's fine. Yeah. That's a very, it's a very generous group. Um, let's hear from a couple other people. Can you stand up?
So, so share, sharing of resources, sharing your gifts. Right? That's, a, that's a form of support. Good, good. So, so we've adapted a ritual of clapping after every, every time everybody speaks. That's an adaptive learning leadership practice. Great, I love the clapping. Let's hear from one other person. Yeah, stand up, stand up. Speak up, speak up, speak up. When you're offering support, uh, you want to make sure you're understanding everyone so they you feel like they're not alone. Right? So your ability to take perspectives and, and have some type of empathy. All right, good. All right. So of these four elements, let's talk about belonging. Um, really, really quickly, uh, recall a time when you felt you did not belong. Okay, recall the feelings. Where, do you, where did you feel the uh, lack of belonging, the sense of alienation in your body? Or did you feel it at all? One of the primary primary things, or the first things that we, that we do with leadership, is say who who belongs. How do we create uh, an organization, a space, a community, uh, uh, a program where people feel belonging? They feel connected. Right? Um, we, we live in a paradoxical time, as you heard, and probably will continue to hear throughout your lifetime. Where, in, in many ways, we're very, very, very connected, perhaps overly overly connected digitally. And yet, there seems to be, in, in, in many ways, an increasing sense of alienation, fragmentation, um, uh, sense of disconnect, sense of sadness, sense of fear, sense of depression. Yeah. It's interesting to be talking about these things and then feel the community and the environment in the room go, where I could, I could feel that, that this is landing or resonating to some extent. That's why belonging is so important. Um, as I, when I was a young child, I was very introverted, and for whatever reason, I had a hard time connecting with uh, um, uh, people. You know, uh, people I felt, I felt really, really disconnected with people, and I found a deep connection with Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson, those of you who don't know, was a, an amazing basketball player, uh, played for the Lakers, uh, and um, I developed a relationship with his public persona and his basketball. Now, granted, I, I only met him once and I didn't talk to him, but I had what some scholars call an imaginary social world, right? We all have imaginary, you know, what if I met Beyonce, what if I, you know, what if I met this person? You know, we all live in fantasy world at some time, if not most of the time in our lives, but that's just part of the human experience, right? But I watched the magic and his enthusiasm for basketball, his, his love for helping his teammates out, his general joy inspired me, right? And I started to practice, and I practiced, and I practiced by myself, uh, and I would get better and better, uh, and then I started to practice with other people, uh, at my school, and some of the some of the people were very generous in terms of bringing me in and making me feel like I belong, and some of them were not. Right? But I continued to practice, and I practiced with those who felt like uh, who wanted to support me and, and showed that I belonged. And so I would very, very much I could easily say that basketball probably probably saved my life. Yeah, I think there there was such a deep degree of of disconnect, of alienation, and even the deep depression that, that basketball, uh, among other support relationships that, I, that would emerge in my life, uh, was instrumental in, in, uh, in me feeling that I had a sense of belonging. Um, I'm not trying to get heavy handed here, but, but, but I think everybody here knows, either by direct experience or through uh, family relationships or relationships with friends or partners, that, that feeling uh, disconnected or alienated is a real thing. Yeah? Can we agree upon that? So it's primary, and that's, that's why I'm kind of like leading with it. So, so it's to not feel, not to feel alienated, to feel connected to others, to feel a sense of meaning. Oops. Um, and what 
what you notice is that there's an emotional quality about the notion of, of, of belonging, right? And that's something that practices and rituals evoke. And so to take a step back, and we'll, we'll look at what I did in the very beginning, I had you bring to mind somebody in the past who you really admired or respected. We brought that person's memory. And, and, and probably likely for some of you, if not most of you, some sense of feeling of connection to that person, right? Then we bring that into the room. So I did that purposefully, purposefully to demonstrate a couple of things. One, we are part of a larger community. We're not just individuals. And sometimes those communities aren't seen, and their influences aren't seen. And two, it fosters a sense of belonging. You belong here, in this classroom, at this lecture, in this conversation. Right? I, wanted, I, I didn't want people to be checking out. I didn't want to be people to be checking their phone all the time. Or, you know, I wanted your, your presence. You know, and creating a sense of belonging brings people present. Does that make sense? Yes? No? Yes. Okay, okay, good. Just saw a little bit of it. How's this going so far? Is the, is the pace good? All right. Uh, so there's an emotional quality about belonging. Um, so let's do this for one minute. Uh, one minute each. Actually, let's not do that. <laughs> we have, we have to one. one. Well, 50. All right, one, let's do this for uh, one minute each. So don't you turn to the person next to you and talk about the ways in which you cultivate belonging, either in an informal leadership setting, family, friend, peers, or formal leadership setting, club, sorority, fraternity, res hall, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. How do you cultivate belonging? One minute each. <laughs> If you haven't already switched, make sure that each person is heard. Alright, sounds like we're coming to a natural close. Feels that way to me. One last thing about belonging. This is this is something that we study in ethnic studies and cultural studies and gender studies and all type of Studies that look at identity politics and social justice issues. Uh, wake up! There you go. Um, I actually, when I was a TA one time in my senior year in college at UC Santa Cruz, as a TA, in a, in a lecture hall of 200 people, I fell asleep in the front row. I was taking 22, I was taking 22 units, and, and, and for quarter units, quarter units, mind you, not semester, playing basketball. I, I wasn't sleeping, and so, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, I just say wake up. My, my teacher threw, threw something at me and uh, made everybody laugh at me. So I wasn't going to do that. I was going to do that to you, but I was kind of Thanks for waking up. No, not you. Yeah, no, no. One more thing about belonging. One last thing about belonging is that it kind of, the, 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 the term and concept itself speaks to somebody who's in and somebody who's out. Right? Now I know we're learning to become more and more spacious and inclusive. Right? So we, we want to, to involve and engage and work with as many different people as possible. That's, that's aspirational. Learning how to do that, particularly if we didn't come from places where that was modeled, where we saw it, is challenging to do. And this is part of the reason why you take courses like this and get involved and say, how do we become more inclusive in the ways we create belonging? All right? Because if it speaks to 
somebody belongs, and sometimes it's appropriate for other people to belong or not. You know, when I first started playing basketball, I had no skills, I didn't belong on the court. <laughs> when I developed more and more skills, I belonged on the court, right? So some, some, some type of communities, there belonging, there's a, a, clear, a clear reason why there's belonging in people who are not ready to belong. And when I wasn't quite ready for the court, I still had a community of support to help me so I can belong to something larger. Right? Folks are following me? The question that we need to ask is, who belongs and who doesn't belong, and why? Right? Why aren't people belonging? Why don't good people feel, feel like they belong? And so I'm, that's all I'm going to say. We can get into deep, deep stuff about that around race, class, gender, sexuality, uh, but we don't have time for that. But just a question, who belongs, who doesn't belong, and why? Okay? Um, let's talk about purpose, because it's, so, it's kind of close to belonging. So, so community is, uh, as the, the second aspect or element of, uh, of communities, purpose is really, really important. And people, people build communities for all types of reasons. Um, there's a, a primary reason, which is very similar to belonging, is for survival and safety. Okay, I need to survive, I need to feel whether or not I am, uh, I grew up where, where there was a lot of poverty uh, in my communities and schools. And there were a lot of gangs. And people have a really negative aspect of gangs, but for those kids, that sense of belonging and community was instrumental to their survival, given those types of conditions. Is that ideal? Is it, is it awesome? No, it sucks. Right? But there's a need for survival and safety, and if you don't have any other structure of support, or limited structure of support or resources, for a range of reasons why, as we can talk about, um, then coming together as a community uh, for survival and safety is primary. We could say that people who come to sororities and fraternities on campus because they don't feel connected and they want to feel connected and, and they don't necessarily feel safe or uncertain and so they join a sorority or fraternity, that's, that, that can be for many people an act of survival or safety. Right? I don't want to feel alienated. I want to make friends. I want to feel grounded in, in this move to college. Right? I want to get involved. Right? Some people, some students on this campus, which is uh, not very diverse in terms of uh, ethnic diversity, um, finding other people who look similar, if not like you, can make you feel safe, particularly if there's a lot of stuff on campus that makes you feel unsafe, Sorry, which, which happens on this campus and this community quite a bit. You just have to ask <laughs> if, you haven't, or if you haven't seen it already. Um, other purposes of community. For exploration, for empowerment, right? Basketball community. I, want, I found power in basketball. People found power in book clubs, right? Hobbies, right? I want to explore what it means to garden. I want to explore sustainability. I want to explore service. You know, I want to feel powerful. I want to feel connected to something larger. Right? That's, another, that's another purpose of community. Um, pleasure. Let's not let's not forget pleasure and fun, right? I had one of the best nights of my life, and I'm not, I'm not kidding you, uh, at the club the other night. Um, I was in Sacramento, and I, I saw this amazing cover band. The music was incredible. I had my family, I had my friends, I had my partner, I had people I hadn't seen in a long time, all there. We were dancing. We were altered through our dancing and other forms of uh, altered states, all the purpose of the altered states. And it was wonderful, and I'm not condoning all the altered states and all this stuff, but I'm just saying that the purpose of that sense of community was to have fun, and to release, right? And to dance, and to experiment with different types of dance and movement, and maybe flirt, or maybe this. You know, it, 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 that is also a big reason why we find community. It's natural, it's called eros, right? Uh, there's, there, 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 there's higher purpose. Maybe we feel compelled to community for some religious region. Region, or maybe the community is religious. Maybe it's service-based. Maybe, maybe our purpose for community is I seek social and economic mobility. Right? And that's why I come to school. Some people might come to school because I want to have fun and learn or explore. Some people come to school and like, no, I didn't come from anything in terms of money. I want to get a degree and I want to come up. I wanted to get a degree and get a good job. Right? And so they surround themselves with a community that supports these things. 
And there could be communities that, that have some other type of political agenda or desire. Uh, a lot of my work is, is politically motivated around social justice, making sure that, that resources and access to resources are more equitable or, or equal. Right? And that's a, so I, I'm a part of community bases that share that political agenda. And some communities, are, like I mentioned with identities, intersect, right? Um, you can go, I, I had some of the best, best, best times at parties where you, you organized around a particular political, political issue, you danced, you, you, know, you found a date, you ate food, and uh, maybe you had some type of spiritual experience all in together. Um, but these communities intersect as well. So, the, so determining, you know, what purpose am I working with uh, uh, with regards to leadership. What is the higher purpose? What is the purpose of, of the community that I'm working with? If I'm working with my with peer mentors, as a peer mentor, it's to make sure that they know what resources that are, that are going, what resources Sonoma State has, and that they feel connected uh, to me and the materials, right? It's, 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 it's a bit of safety and also connecting to resources, right? Uh, if it's you working in the rest hall, it, it probably spans everything, <laughs> everything that I talked about. Um, but the idea is, you know, Communities have multiple purposes, and, and you begin to identify which one, uh, which one or which ones are important to you and the ones and the people you're working with. So part of leadership in uh, co-creating vital communities is now that we have a sense of belonging, now that we have a sense of purpose, how are we creating support for, the, for, our, for uh, our participants and ourselves so that we can achieve our purpose? Some of you named, named it already. You know, how do I practice deep listening? How do I make sure that I'm connecting with people so they know that I actually genuinely care about them? Um, one of the ways in which I offer support through the hub is uh, when I meet with students, uh, whether in a group or in one-on-one, -on -one, I really genuinely want to know who they are. And I genuinely want to connect with them and hear what they're passionate about. I want to connect with them. And I think the best leaders, the best leaders uh, that I've encountered in my life sit or genuinely interested in you and listen right? and, then they, and then they provide whatever support they have and that could be ideas but let me brainstorm something with you support support can come in, in a range of areas support can come from a range of things right I can I can be a sounding board uh, I know somebody who um, who can help you with that paper I know somebody who has that interest in sustainability you need to meet through my network um, Oh, actually, I know this type of exercise that will you know, that will get you to stretch a little bit better if you're, on, if you're into yoga or stretching or sports, etc., etc., etc. And then on the flip side of that, you're not just providing support for that person or those people in your community. You're out, also actively looking for support right? because you're growing as a leader. Right? It's, it's ongoing. The learning is ongoing. Right? Maybe the support on campus. Uh, Campus is a really good place because you have support and resources that you might not have outside of campus in terms of funds. I want to put on a program. Maybe there's funds from, maybe there's funds for the rest hall. Maybe there's funds for the hub. Maybe there's funds for ASP. Maybe there's funds through my department. Right. So that's another way to begin to look at support and see the community, see the community uh, as a as a um, as an ecosystem of support. Um, but I think the last thing is that support is that it's, it's really, really important that we are uh, looking for that and generating support for ourselves, particularly if we, if, particularly if we are, we see ourselves formally as leaders. And the last thing I'll talk about really quickly, um, and I'll open up for a couple of questions, um, is learning. And you guys, you, kind of, you, you all kind of got this uh, in that communities that are most vital or healthy are the ones that continually learn. Okay. Um, learning, learning is something that uh, isn't just something you read in books, isn't, it, isn't something that, I mean, anything can be a, an opportunity to learn if we approach it as such. Right? Any relationship, anything can be an opportunity to learn if we approach it as such. Right? So you can learn about yourself, okay, how, how am I relating, for instance, when I, did this, when I did the ritual this morning, and you reflect upon it, how did I respond to that ritual? Did it make me feel uncomfortable? Was it cool? Was it kind of strange? But if you, but if you actively reflect upon it, 
you get to learn something about yourself. Oh, that was kind of, it felt a bit awkward at first, and then I heard the rhythm, and it felt better. That's kind of cool, but kind of different. You know? So there's always an opportunity to learn if you, if you approach community and relationship and leadership, there's an opportunity to learn. Um, as leaders, it's, uh, I think, uh, it's the, the, lead, the, the literature I see on leadership development and capacity building is that you know, we, we, we grow in the ability to take more and more perspectives. I think all of us, uh, all of us at some time feel like, oh, my worldview, my perspective is the right perspective, right, based on my identity and, and the places that I come from. And you realize that, oh, uh, there's, there's 200 people or 150 people in this room. Maybe they have 150 different worldviews or perspectives. Some might be similar to mine, some not. So when we talk about learning, it's the ability to really, how do we take other people's perspective, right, perspective taking. Somebody mentioned that earlier or, or intimated uh, the importance of perspective taking. And then two, how do we seek perspectives that are different than ours? That's hard, right? Particularly if we're part of a community that's really, uh, we have a political agenda. Okay, say that I'm part of a club that, say I'm part of a Young Republic, Republicans Club, or Young Democrats Club, or, you know, either or. You know, and I want, I want to engage somebody in debate, and I want to learn more. You know, it's easy, to, easy for me to take the perspective of other people who have the same political belief system as I do, but it's harder to really seek out uh, the perspective of others who I might not might not agree with, right? There might be some value in seeking out perspective. And, and, and most most uh, people who are writing on leadership development say that people grow as they grow as leader leaders. They not only grow in their ability to take perspectives, but to seek perspectives. And last and finally is to coordinate these perspectives to something bigger, right? So say I'm working with a team uh, on a group project, you know, and five or six of us or seven of us have a, have an idea of what what this project should be. So there's multiple perspectives. And say, okay, I can listen to multiple perspectives, that's good. I might even, maybe this person over here is quiet, and so I'll ask, you know, I'll seek their perspective out. But now that I have all these perspectives, now what do we do with it? How do we begin to organize it to something that's fitting, to something that's pragmatic, something that makes sense? And that's something that takes a little bit of exercise. So learning, learning and perspective taking naturally brings up tensions and conflicts. And there's a, there can be a value in approaching leadership and community as tensions and conflicts are natural parts of the evolution of communities and the evolution of leadership. How do I best engage them? Right? How do I best engage them? And that is an ongoing learning process. Um, so I think I'll close there. I think that's a lot of information. Uh, um, we have four minutes. For any questions, but I just want to say it's leadership as community building involves fostering belonging, purpose, support, and learning for myself and others. Don't pack up yet, please. I want to. I want to just just hold the space four more minutes longer. Hold the container four more minutes longer. The integrity of this learning space. Thank you. It makes me feel more complete with this. Um, any questions or comments? Anything particularly compelling or salient that's came up through this talk or this conversation? Um, uh, I'm Jeff, and I just want to say I really like what you said about the hundred games, although they're not the best thing, it gives a sense of safety in communities about really people in the area. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. We take the perspective of we, let's humanize people who might not come from the same places that we come from. We might not have food or, or access to jobs or things or schools. And let's humanize them, even if they're doing things that are really painful and painful to others. Thank you for that. That's an that's a, that's a important perspective to take. One or two more. Yeah. Can you, send, can you say your name? That, that, that's, um, well, the short answer, I'll give you a short answer. You know, one, one, one thing is that you, I, I would encourage them to come to a program in the hub, right? So that's a short answer. 
um, outside of university settings where there, there might not be, you might not be resourced is one thing that I like to practice, and this is, this is challenging sometimes, is, is, is really meeting people where they're at. Right? I have somebody who, who uh, constantly tells me I'm going to go to hell, and, and uh, he's, he's, a, he's very, very conservative in his religious belief. And um, I don't share that religious belief. I honor it, and I, and I have my own, my own spiritual life. But I honor it, and I say, you know what, I really I, I, I meet him. I said, I really, really admire the fact that you have such a strong community and faith. Right? And I think when people, when you honor who they are first, and genuinely do so, which is hard for us to do, particularly around politics or things around religion, right, there might be a little bit more opening for them to be, to, to be open to listening a little bit more. If I'm just saying, you can't be this way, you've got to be this way, folks aren't going to be apt to listen. That's a, that's a short term. One more person. You saw it, right? I think um, the last one I did was to ask that we don't pack up, because when we pack up, it, it, it leaks energy out of the, out of the environment, it takes the focus off off what we agreed to come here and do, which is to learn and engage each other. Right? So one of my one of my rituals is actually speaking to things that that, that we don't normally speak to sometimes and being direct. Thank you very much, y'all.